our psychological health is one of the most tenacious, um, vulnerable areas of our life. Like without a healthy mind, do we have a healthy body? Is that even possible? And what constitutes a healthy mind? What about depression, anxiety, mood swings, memory loss, brain fog? Are those things that determine the the rest of our lives? Psychoses, um, psychiatric disorders, bipolar. You know, I always say, is it bipolar or hormonal? And it's most likely hormonal. What are the underlying issues that relate to our our mindset, our psychiatric um, health, our psychological health? And how can we identify what's going on? So it is not the, we don't fall into the prescription model as a first line therapy, which is often the case. When you come to me as a physician and you're complaining of anxiety, depression, mood swings, really are compelled to say, okay, well, this is bad enough for you to mention it to me. Let me prescribe you something. And so, and that's, that's piece of the puzzle, but I may do that and also say, let's get to the underlying reason of this. Let's look at some functional issues. Let's look at your mineral and vitamin balance, your magnesium levels, your vitamin D levels. Low vitamin D is associated with depression as is low progesterone and low testosterone. So let's look to the underlying issues, but let's also address what's going on. And as a result of experiencing my own journey, recognizing that, you know what, first step is doing all these things. It's food as medicine, it's lifestyle medicine. And the medication, which often anyway, takes 30 to 60 days to work, um, you know, is, is second tertiary or, you know, way down the line type of intervention. What do we need to do first? And how can we stave off things getting so desperately bad that we're looking for an immediate crutch? But yet when we need that, we need it, but recognize that we should be able to, and should be encouraged to be able to get off of it once we address the underlying issues. And it's not easy. It is not easy. And I um, really understand that and have been there myself. So I want to talk about this today in this episode of the Girlfriend Doctor Show. Hmm. So my guest today is Dr. Kelly Brogan, and she argues that our experiences aren't problems or pathologies, that they reflect what we need to accept, acknowledge, and transform in order to truly become who we are. She wrote, own yourself, and this is a journey of healing and also something more, a journey of coming home to ourselves. And one thing, welcome, Kelly. Welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. It's great to have you here. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Well, one of the things that you say and that you um, exemplify is owning yourself, is owning your um, your your authenticity, owning your kink, owning your courage, cor- you know, courageousness. Is that the word? Courageousness, like owning your boldness, being bold and brave, and being okay with going outside the norms and what that's looked like for you. So there's been so much. And also what you say, we're going to touch a few topics. I really want to, to talk with you about, but the owning yourself, owning all aspects of yourself, and you can be this and that that's a really huge piece. So everything that you just listed is like the easy stuff. (laughs) Honestly, it's the irrepressible stuff. It's the compulsive stuff. It's the, I can't not do that, um, stuff. The, the challenge, I mean, I spend most of my morning in this, in this swirl, in this work, of just really recognizing that every single time I want to judge, blame, condemn, every single time I want to enter into the field of controversy and I want to win, every single time I am subtly but intentionally savoring that I have something that somebody I, I don't like or don't resonate with doesn't have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to recognize that those are all opportunities for me to own myself, for me to get in contact with the part of me that that believes that that's the only way to be safe. The part of me be- that believes that that's the only way to know love and connection and approval is through these power over channels, is through this winning, is through being right, um, is through having more. Um, 
and it's so hard. It is so uncomfortable. And all you want to do in those moments is I call it commiseration connection, right? It's like reach out to your girlfriend and be like, can you believe this? Like, this is so horrible. Let me tell you my victim story. And you want them to collude and you want them to enter into the rescuer angle of the victim triangle against whomever it is, you know, whether it's a system or a person or whatever that I've identified or you've identified as being the problem. Right. And that is the daily grind of the self-reclamation process that has very little to do, honestly, with like boldly speaking my truth or courageously putting myself out there as like a disruptor, provocateur, um, truth teller, whatever it is that I cannot do that. Like I, I would, I would feel muzzled and horrible going to bed at night. Like if I didn't do that, that's not where the work is for me temperamentally anyway, like my personality. Um, the work is in stretching into the discomfort, like moving beyond the junk food of, you know, commiserating around a victim story. And I'm really good at hiding them, uh, even from my, you know, best friends and, and sort of like subtly roping them into supporting this, you know, this, this old story of consciousness, which is that there's such a thing as winning. Okay. So when you say that, cause you know, what's wrong with, um, looping in your friends, what's wrong with commiserating or colluding? What, you know, how is that, how is that wrong? How is that working to our negative? Yeah, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and in fact, for many, many years of my process, I don't know that I would have been able to have compassion modeled for me that I could offer myself if I didn't have it from loved ones and friends, right? So there's nothing wrong with it. I, I think it's almost potentially maturational, or maybe it's just a phase you get to where you're like, I'm sick of the same shit. Like I'm sick of seeing the same pattern. I am sick of playing the yes. same tape over and over and over again. You know, poor me, he did this, they did that. Can you believe it? You know, this is so unjust. This is so unfair. So right? That's Whatever. the victim story. Our victim story. And we each have a special tagline, right? Like we each have, like mine is often like, you know, no one can handle, well, it depends the context, right? But it's the same energy. It's like, no one can handle me. You know, they, they need to diminish me or they need to control me or they need to silence me or whatever. Um, or maybe it's like, no one is really there for me in the end. Um, or maybe it's like, you know, everyone is, is fundamentally, you know, unable to really see me because they're just threatened or whatever. You know, it's like any version of like, what is happening is bad. I don't like it. And I'm powerless to do anything about it. And there's and that so powerlessness that's yeah. bad, right? And if you don't, it first is being aware of that story, right? So you're not recreating it over and over again so that you can deviate from it. So let's talk, let's talk about that. And you'll see me, my head down and I'm writing. I take, I'm taking lots of notes. And also you may hear my grandbaby in the background upstairs. Um, so just uh, for my listeners, that is what is going on. <laughs> Amazing. So how do you like first is gain that awareness that this is a story you've been telling yourself? You feel it, you feel it in your body. I think before, when you become attuned to these sensations in your body, um, which really in my worldview can only really happen until you've done sort of the chopping wood, carrying water, I call it, of lifestyle reclamation and lifestyle change. Because if you've got like bloating and joint pain and, you know, like, muscle soreness and weakness and your headaches and whatever you're in this sort of blur of all of these messages inviting you to begin to ritualize self-care it's very hard to feel what's going on in your body and i will speak from personal experience as somebody who never even was diagnosed with anything you know until whatever it was 2010 um that i never had a feeling state why because I had very, very effective defenses. So I might, 
feel something like fear or sadness. Um, and instead all that would happen is I would, is I would have an urgent impulse to like communicate, to send an email, to, you know, make a phone call, to write a text or whatever, so that I can engage the being right defense system. And, you know, mm -hmm. I could have been an attorney. Like I, I'm very wired in my trauma-based defenses to argue my point. <laughs> and you even said that, you know, that I am somebody who has historically argued points. Uh, I've not just in invited people to consider them, right? And so because that was so reflexive, I never felt the feeling. That's the point of defenses is that they keep you from feeling the feelings. Why? Because we imagine and learn as children that this is an existential matter, right? That those feelings get coupled with literally life or death consequences. And so we will strategize, we will observe, we will manipulate, we will do whatever it takes, appease to, you know, this fight, 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 flight, fawn or freeze, right? Like that's sort of the rubric of like all of our options. And then they get baked in to our personalities so that we don't have to feel the thing. However, whenever we feel like, I often feel like, um, like a rush of energy up my chest and it's super uncomfortable when I feel quote unquote anxious. Uh, that is a sign that my thoughts are in the victim space, right? And that my thoughts are not aligned with my native power, with my connection, with my trust, my faith, um, with, with whatever it is that offers me a sense of everything is okay. Because there's always this dimension of you that not only thinks that everything is okay and approves of what is, but actually kind of delights in the mess of it all. You know, I, I've been very um, excited to learn of Carolyn Elliott's work. She, she wrote a book called Existential Kink. And it's just brought so many of my beliefs into even higher relief because there is a kind of deliciousness that we relish in the warfare space, in the victim space, in the power over space. And it has to do with the sensations in the body. It's like arousal we think is just sexual pleasure, but it's really a much broader spectrum of bodily sensation, right? Because if I get an email that's very disturbing to me, I might have that rush up my chest into my throat and I might feel like kind of hot in the back of my head. If I'm getting ready to go out on a date with a man I think might be the one for me, I might have that going on all afternoon. And, and without the narrative, the sensation, very similar. Right. That's a great point. Yeah. I want you to go back and define existential kink. So what do you mean by that? Okay. Well, it's her phrase, Carolyn Elliott's phrase, and she wrote a book by that name. And I've written, you know, my book report uh, summary on it in, a, in blog form on my site. Um, but it essentially means that if I could, you know, be at liberty to paraphrase, um, that this play that we call our suffering and our struggle is actually something that we take pleasure in. And she penned a phrase I love and I reference all the time, which is that having is evidence of wanting. So if you have something in your life, it's because you want it to be this way, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't have something that you want, it's because you don't actually want it. And so you have this split will and you have the part of you that is gatekeeping all of the things you would lose, all of the consequences of having the thing you want, right? Let's say I want a huge, beautiful mansion that I want to live in. Well, that sounds great. Of course. Why don't I have that mansion? Well, maybe because if I did, my friends would be jealous and reject me. Maybe I would feel subconscious all the time and not even know how to have people over because I would feel like they were judging me. Maybe I would feel like I would have to take care of everybody because now I'm the one who obviously has the money or why would I have this mansion, right? So it comes with all of these psychic strings attached that make sense out of the fact that I'm not ready to have that thing. Right, right. Now, do you um, think that we need to know the why or do we need to have the skills to um, envision ourselves, feel what it feels like to have those things? Do we have to know where these feelings are coming, where the boundaries are coming from? That's a really, really deep question. Um, I think it depends on how you can end the fight, right? Like for me as a very um, mental, 
you know, psychologically oriented person who flies up here when I don't want to be in my body. Like some people just dissociate, right? Like they just depersonalize. They just sort of check out um, and they go blank up here. When I can't handle what's happening in here, I get super sharp up here, right? So for me, you know, I, I wrote in my last book, like suffering ends where meaning begins. If I can find meaning in what I am experiencing, I have a couple degrees of freedom where then I can start to play with possibilities that what I think may not actually be the full truth, right? And there may be another perspective and it may actually be a perspective that a part of me is already holding, you know? So I have found that the modalities that have changed my life, I would say at least in the past five years, most significantly um, have involved insight oriented uh, methods, right? So I, I would say specifically family constellation work and parts work. And they're very related, they're very similar, and it's just sort of looking at systems and how systems and their their associated parts or individuals or members um, can become very toxic and painful and dysfunctional when they are stuck in a certain kind of trauma pattern, in a certain kind of understanding, in a certain kind of relationship to one another. And when you see that, that that's going on and you recognize there's not a bad guy in here, in this circus, right? Then it just all gets drained, right? And then you can almost like reorganize things and assign to new roles um, these otherwise disenfranchised and disoriented parts. So I do think that in many ways, the why is important, the insight is important. However, I will say that the other modality that I am very passionate about is somatic experiencing. Um, I have uh, you know, a coach, Whitney, who, who I've been working with for over a year, and most of what we do is expand my capacity to hold in my body feelings associated with incompletion. That's a big one for me. Like what happens if I don't have closure? What happens if I can't finish the thing? What happens if I can't make sure it happens, right? How, how long can I hold that? How long can I hold celebration and satisfaction and fulfillment, right? If I create something, accomplish something, if I put together something from Ikea, you know, or, or I, you know, sell a best-selling book. How long can I actually hold that feeling before I'm looking for problems, before I'm back in the vibration of contraction? Because I literally don't have the nervous system capacity to hold it. That's so, so you know, true. I would say mm -hmm. it's both. Both. I, I've seen that in, I've seen that in my own life too, right? It's like, okay, well, accomplish, what's the next accomplishment? Accomplish, what's the next accomplishment versus celebrating, sitting in that celebration and thinking, okay, how can I, how can I do that better? How can I do that better? So what is the tool you learn to sit in that celebration, to sit in that satisfaction, to sit in that longer and hold on that so that that is more of the, the envelope you're living in or the environment that you're living in. Expansion is the word I was looking for. So there's a, a practice called pendulation, um, which comes out of Peter Levine's work, which is essentially using the power of your attention, which is arguably one of our superpowers, right? Because you choose what to focus on in any given moment. And you can focus on something that gives you thoughts that are old, you know, sort of the record skipping kind of thoughts of your sad, horrible situation. Or you can choose to notice like, how, how nice the breeze feels on my skin or how comfortable, you know, these shorts are, or how sweet my kitty looks over there. You know, I, my focus, my attention is a very powerful vector. So if I get the, get the nasty email, let's say, and I feel that rush in my chest, or if I accomplish the thing, right? Like I, I've wanted this for so long and, oh my God, I finally got it. And on to the next, I mean, this, this is exactly how it is for all of us. Um, or even I have the orgasm and I'm like, okay, what are we going to have for lunch? <laughs> you know, or after whatever, um, you sit with the sensation for 10 seconds and you really go into it. You enter it as if it's a room and you even allow it to get bigger because you're only there for 10 seconds. And then you find a part of your body. It could even be a little point that is totally chill. That's totally Okay. And that doesn't have any of that sensation going on. For me, it's almost always my thighs for whatever reason. I'll find a place on my thighs. And then for I stay there for 10 seconds. And you go back and forth between these areas. And you just grow your ability to hold the sensations associated 
with these feelings that of course have thoughts and beliefs at the root of them. And so that gives you that ability to take that time and insight and it doesn't take long. It sounds like. No, it doesn't take long and it's very difficult, right? Yeah. Because yeah. If, you, if you just have a feeling and you sit down, which is also an option, sit down, set a timer for three minutes. For me, I'm already thinking within probably 15 seconds. I'm already thinking about stuff, right? I've already left, I've already left vacated. the feeling. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, I'm a big believer in the power of complementary energies and masculine feminine polarity, both within and in dynamic. And if I don't, so I'm single right now, right? And if I want this like conscious king man, right? Who's going to be super dialed in, super engaged, super observant, super present, like totally unflappably there for me so that I can be this sort of energetic fountain, swirling fountain of femininity, right? If my belief system is, and not just mine, that if I cannot attend to myself in that way, I'll never be a match. And I haven't been historically for that kind of man, right? So yeah. can I be present to myself for even a few minutes? Mm, actually, it's really difficult, right? Like I just finished um, a week long water only fast and it was very minimal stimulus. So like no computer tech, whatever. Bravo. No Good for you. That is so hard. You guys water fast was- for seven days and no computer. Like, I don't know what's worse. You just lay on a couch and you sip water. And I was inspired by my friend, Andy Kaufman, who did it for 26 days, many wow. people, 40 days. I worked with Lauren Lockman out of Tanglewood in Costa Rica. And it was ar- arguably like the hardest thing I've ever done. Why? Um, because I was with myself for the first time in my adult life, mm. unmitigated, no distractions, and honestly taking food out of the picture and juices and all that, whatever, taking all of those addictions out of the picture allowed me the opportunity to simply without any sort of crutch, be with whatever is. Mm-hmm. And the parts that I met of myself um, were holding immense amounts of anguish and pain and really, you know, almost um, existential level, like, rejection of this human experience it was a very deep spiritual uh portal you know that i went through and all of that is to say the only thing asked of me for that entire week and the reason you design the conditions so that you can just lay on a couch for a week is so you can be present to yourself that's it just be with yourself is it that take bad? away the distractions it's that be bad what's really yeah yeah <laughs> wow and and that, you know, it's detoxing, right? Your organs hold energies. And as you're cleansing those, those energies start to move and those feelings, emotions, things that have been locked in can appear, can manifest, can, you know, it's, they, they need to escape, but that process can be very, very scary. And I know whether it's, it's a three day fast or seven day fast. I think the most challenging thing that I've done is dry fasting, for over 78 hours. And, um, and that, I mean, you get into the state of ketosis, like with, and with water fasting, you get into the state of ketosis and you've, the beauty of what you've done is you've also eliminated the distractions in your surroundings that can take you away from being your, you know, being with yourself. I think that's, that's fabulous. That's a big gift that you gave yourself. Yeah, it was. And it, it was humbling to observe, how difficult it was and to recognize, you know, that there's a long, I don't know, maybe it's not long, but there's a path in front of me that involves simply being with what is going on inside me. That's it. And not there's, you know, not changing it, not reforming it, not integrating and healing it. Like first just be with it, which of course is what every child has always wanted, probably from the dawn of time from their caregiver is, can you just be with me? Be with me. Oh my gosh. That is, that is so true. And as a a single mom myself and, you know, uh, wearing all the hats that we wear in our own household and, and just, you know, running a business, right. Taking care of the family, that, that discipline in and of itself, being present, pausing, being present is, is still, still very much a practice and um, an awareness that, you know, that I have to, 
to be with and work on even more. Kelly, you have gone from your like traditional um, psychiatry background as a to a holistic psychiatrist. And one of the things is you talk about medications. I'm going to circle back because I, I definitely want to touch back on with existential kink and also BDSM. So just dropping a bomb here for you, my audience to listen to. We haven't yes. talked much about this. So, um, so to touch in, because I promised my audience, I would talk about getting off of medications, um, psychiatric medications, and also the understanding the meaning behind symptoms, anxiety, depression, bipolar, um, you know, either prior to starting medication to really get to the underlying reasons. And I wanted your take on that because this has been one of your battles. Yeah. Yes. I mean, my first book, there's an exploding pill on the cover. So I was, uh, you know, I ran out onto the battlefield, you know, naked and screaming with my sword aloft and, you know, hundreds of references to defend my perspective, which is, you know, has certainly evolved to some extent and softened to some extent, extent. I can explain what I mean by that. But at the time was that we've been sold a bill of goods. You know, we've been told these medications are effective when they aren't, according to the science itself, that most of which was hidden in a locked file drawer, totally legally um, by the, you know, parameters of FDA approval and associated, you know, pharmaceutical um, shenanigans when it comes to research. Um, they are, you know, far more dangerous than you could ever be told about because as a prescriber, I never knew about the, um, you know, the, the adverse effect profile, which included, you know, includes, you know, impulsive homicide and suicide, which includes, you know, dependency like nothing else I've ever seen. Um, and I don't think we have any idea why that is. So why are these the most habit forming chemicals on the planet? What it is to come off of some of these drugs physiologically, and I'm not even talking psycho-spiritually or psycho-emotionally, um, warrants the erection of rehabs in every town, you know, just for this purpose. Um, and I was taught in my training, oh, you just, you just decrease the dose by a quarter, you know, every week or so it's fine. And of course, then when patients would, you know, be destabilized, we would say, oh, you see, you got it. You should stay on your medication. And now you see, look how, look how you can't even sleep. You're so anxious. You're so uncomfortable. Of course, you know, Oh, and, and uh, you know, the, the rectal bleeding and the hair loss and, you know, like the rash that just cropped up, well, I'll send you to various specialists for that. That's not related, right? So the um, efficacy and safety profile in the context of how alternative options were ever presented or are typically presented, which is this kind of like window dressing, like, sure, you want to take some fish oil or St. John's wort with your Prozac? Yeah, that might help. That's great. In fact, there's pharmaceutical versions of fish oil at this point and has, has been the case for many years. Um, so we are conditioned also by the fact that we are one of three countries that allows for director to consumer advertising. Which is blows my mind. It blows my mind. It's like 90% of the world is not allowed to, uh, pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to market and they're marketing to our children. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, I, I've told this story to my audience before, but when my firstborn daughter was six years old, she came to me asking for D-E-T-R-O-L-L-A. That's a medicine, Dutch Hall L-A. That's a medicine for bladder urgency. Typically it's prescribed in, in the elderly for that urge symptom. But she was watching a commercial which said, you know, do you rush to the bathroom? And she's like had that urgency. And it was a big slap in my face, essentially like, oh my gosh, no. Stop the caffeine, stop the sugar, stop the preservatives, the artificial coloring, food colorings, and these things. And it it is that marketing that is brainwashed a generation, generations now into because she's 26. So has brainwashed generations, especially, you know, into thinking they need a pill for their behavior. I sat with my daughters at a school table at my daughter's lunch one year and um and six out of the 18 kids got up and were getting up at, at lunch. And I said, where are you going? And one of the girls said, I have to get the medicine that makes me behave. And I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, that's what she's thinking. She needs a pill to behave. And it's so it goes, it's beyond the pharmacologic effect of the drug. It's the message we're sending 
to people, the power that we're taking away from them. We're creating a powerlessness instead of empowering, which is what your message comes through as. Yeah. Although, yes, although (laughs) my perspective has shifted now where, because I don't believe in victimization, um, I actually think that when our ingrained belief system, and you could look at, you know, whether or not you believe that children choose their parents and incarnate in certain families karmically to work certain things out. I don't know. It's not my business. I can only speak about my experience. And I have ceased imagining that I am in a special position to save anyone's life or save the world or whatever. So all that I know is that when I was in the system and I believe this so much that I prescribed to pregnant and breastfeeding women regularly, I was a very, very good fit for that system. It's even if you told me the truth, even if future Dr. Kelly Brogan dropped her book on my desk and I read it, and I certainly had the scientific acumen to understand it at the time, it would not have mattered because my mindset was a match for that system, right? So when you enter that system, you could say, oh, we're being brainwashed. It's no fair. How do these companies have this power? They shouldn't be doing that. Or we can enter into a field uh, and a worldview of radical responsibility. We can educate our children about marketing. You know, my children know that marketing is always, um, you know, and, and it's an angle, right? It's an effort to command your perception. You're either a fertile so- soil for it or you're not, right? Like we pass pharmaceutical billboards all the time and nobody cares. That doesn't have any effect. On, we're not being brainwashed. It doesn't matter because it, it doesn't have anywhere to enter right? It's like not relevant. And so when you're a match for this system and you enter the system, you will experience your own disempowerment. You will open an orange bottle every day with your name on it. And you will be reified in the belief that something is wrong with you, right? Because you already believe that, or you wouldn't be taking the thing, right? And that's fine because we all believe that on some level. And when our soul rattles the cage and we begin to have a sense of the light peeking in the dark, right? And we begin to have a sense that maybe there's another way. Yeah, maybe I have a lot of broken, injured parts, damaged parts, and maybe I wanted to experience this so that I could know the contrast of what it is to feel love for those parts, to approve of them, to see that they are carrying a gift, that there's a gem in the cave kind of a thing. And maybe there is somewhere else for me to go, right? Because getting stuck, you know, getting stuck in these patterns, I think most people will agree, like that's hell. That's the hell, right? Like if if, if you're told like, okay, you're going to be sick for a little while and then you're going to be better. The whole experience of being sick is kind of like, all right, I got this. But if you're, if you're like not sure when the sick is going to be over and you just imagine that this is just, it's like a Sisyphusian, like, you know, boulder up the mountain infinitely, that's hell. I think that's the definition of hell for for most of us. So what is it to live in a world where you actually believe that radical change is possible, right? So I've lived that. I've been so many polarities. I mean, I've hated cats. Now I worship cats. You know, I've been an allopath. Now I'm like a, a totally out the system where there's not even a name for whatever, however I live when it, when it comes to medicine, right? I've been super masculinized in my defenses. Then I've been inhabiting a lot of feminine, you know, energies and exploration and creative expression, right? So that sort of um, play shows me even my face, my body, my legs. I look totally different than I did a year ago when I was in, you know, my marriage, let alone five years ago. I mean, I, in one of my blogs, I recently like put a little montage together of like, it's so funny to me how much I have changed. You can change anything. And what is it to live life knowing that change is available to you? And all you have to do is get clear on your desire to embrace it and find the reasons why you may not actually want that change, why it may not be time and you may not be ready and slowly move step-by-step in that direction. So when we circle back to mental illness, anxiety, depression, bipolar, mood swings, and so your approach now would be what exactly? Like, what would you, what do you tell clients? I guess, in looking at what they're ready for. 
Yes. And that's why I am still a big, big believer in, you know, what I refer to as like the Maslow's hierarchy of, you know, behavioral action, right? So I am a huge believer and I have had friends who are very spiritual and, you know, they certainly eat well and all the things. And when they have done, you know, my program, Vital Mind Reset, which honestly, there's not a lot special to my program. Um, the, the thing that is special to the program is that there is a field of belief that has been cultivated over the many years that it's been available, both through my practice and online, where now it holds miracles, right? Like now miracles are possible when you enter into this field, right? The incurable is curable because I have published it in the medical literature as possible just for fun. Um, so anything that you believe is available to you literally can become unlocked once you marinate in the energy of that possibility. So that is what's on offer, you know, through my program. However, what's actually occurring is, like I said, the chopping wood, carrying wood, uh, carrying water of lifestyle change. Why does lifestyle change matter? Who knows? Maybe it really matters that you take inflammatory foods out of your life. Maybe it really matters that you med meditate and detox. Maybe it really matters that you buy the non-toxic detergent versus the toxic detergent and you drink the filtered water versus the tap water, you know, and from a biological perspective, I spent many, many years justifying why all those things matter, you know, why it's a gift you give the body. I'm very convinced now that it's part of the reclamation of the power of choice, mm -hmm. because once you recognize that your choice of what you put in your mouth, your choice of how you act when you wake up in the morning, your choice of what thoughts you're going to allow on repeat, your choice of what time you go to bed, all of these myriad choices we make every single day, that they have impact, that they actually make or break your experience in this human body. Once you reconnect to that, that is when your own snowball starts building, right? And you're like, you could get going down the mountain, like an avalanche, right? And, and literally in the space of months, your entire life can change, right? Your, your meds can become a thing of the past. Your relationship to your diagnosis is complete. Your orientation towards systems and your experience of fear instead of curiosity, you know, all of these things can shift. Why? Because you've reconnected to your power. You've reconnected to that, that knowing that you've got you, you know what to happen, you know, what is the next step? I like that empowerment, right? You're talking empowerment, power. power of choice and what that feels like. I always say your, you know, your diagnosis is not your destiny and your prescription is not your description. I we always that. need to look at what's going on. And I like that, that empowerment piece. It's your power of choice from the way you get up in the morning to the thoughts you keep through your head, to the actions that you take, to the relationships that you maintain and, and, and the care that you give yourself and, the choices we make at the grocery store, the way we empower, our, you know, cleanse our home and, and uh, communicate. This is beautiful, Kelly. Now, I think that just a quick disclaimer, as we're both medical professionals, do not stop your medications, cold turkey. Don't ever do that. They work with a functional doctor, work with someone who can help you heal from the inside out. And there's a process to stopping oh, yeah. medications that's slow and can be very labor intensive or not. It depends. And it's just as long as we're able to get to the underlying reasons and heal that and also heal some of the consequences from the medications. And typically we're talking SSRIs, um, you know, uh, antidepressant medication, other types of, um, psych, you know, psychiatric meds that there's a long list. So we want to look at exactly what's going on heal uh, from yeah. the inside out. I would add that actually in my program and in, I learned the hard way about exactly what you're sharing. When I finished anatomy of an epidemic and I set my prescription pad down for good, never started a patient on medications again. And I started helping patients slowly, um, taper off. And it, I was like running a crisis rehab. I mean, yep. it was the yep. hardest year of my life. And so now the, you know, in, in my books and everything, it's, you do not touch your medications, not even your birth control, nothing until you finish the reset. Yes, I, I agree. Heal. Yes, I agree. Reset, you're saying, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now I wanted to circle on BDSM. Cause you have talked about it. You have brought it up. How has it helped you? What have you discovered with it? And yeah, like, can you talk to us about that a little bit first? 
tell us what it is. Okay. So I want to offer a disclaimer, um, which is that I am certainly not a sexologist. I am not any sort of expert. Um, I don't even have much lived experience. Out of my um, last relationship, I met dimensions of myself that had been colluding around shame-based repression that was very active in um, that dynamic, let's say, and probably my whole life history, where I related in a very specific way um, to my sexuality, um, to sex itself, and to men that is now up for transformation, right? And part of it is this, I think, very relatable conflict that so many women um, are experiencing, which is this sort of like, where are all the real men? Where are all the good men, right? And this almost resentment, like I can do manning <laughs> better than men can, right? Like I can do everything. Like I can run a business, I can raise a family, I can take care of a household, I can self-pleasure, you know, I can do it all. And like, why do I even need a man? And where are they, by the way, <laughs> right? Like, and where is the one who's gonna finally show up so that I can be taken care of, so that I can relax and so that I can exhale into my femininity. And then, you know, men are feeling like super confused about how to be men, right? because they've been largely castrated is like the typical term figuratively by women who have been traumatized by men in their lineage, right? So they've controlled and enculturated their sons to be docile servants, appeasers, right? So their connection to their own animal masculinity, their dark masculine is totally severed. So we have this mess Right. And I do think that there is a tremendous opportunity for women to finally come full circle around what it is that we have been railing against this subjugation, this oppression, this compartmentalization, this diminishment, this like you stay in your wifey corner, kind of like mm -hmm. 1950s caricature thing. Um, when in reality, honestly, I don't know a heterosexual woman who does not want a huge masculine presence in her life who's got her, who's driving the car, right? Figuratively, who is taking care of things, who is making decisions, and who ultimately is so attuned to her energetics, to her feeling body, to her, you know, um, vital force that she is offered a reflection that is actually more valuable than what she can see in herself. And the person who's inspired me the most, the teachings you know, of David Data have informed me for many, many years around this. However, BDSM and specifically, you know, what most um, people know as like sadomasochism, right? Or, or this polarity of the dom and the sub is a fascinating realm that I've you know, really had the opportunity to dive into in the in the past year um, because it appears like a war, right? And it appears like there's an abuser and a victim, right? There's the dom and there's all these impact toys, right? So there might be floggers or whips or chains or bondage materials. There might be language, you know, mm -hmm. like you little whore or whatever. There is all the trappings of abuse, but somehow it's actually the sub who's in charge, right? So there's all these paradoxes, right? The sub is the one who determines the parameters of the play. She- and That's really key part because the rules, the safety around that, that there's, there's a safety net for that. You can't some unhealthy doms or unhealthy abusers are abusers, but in this play dynamic, yeah, creating well, those rules, having that out. That I mean, we talk about shades of gray, right? Introduced right. to the world in shades right. of gray. There's more dimensions to that. Absolutely. And the consensual aspect of creating this container is such that the most sacred expression becomes available, which is that instead of warfare and power over, there is a perfect complementarity where in these seemingly irreconcilable differences, these polarities, 
is the meeting of both people's needs simultaneously. So you would not enter into this kind of dynamic unless you want to grow into the space where you actually get what you want. You actually get what you want, what you say you want. It requires things like surrender. It requires opening. It requires trust, right? It requires moving into or out of the comfort of control. And, and you feeling, right? And being in touch with your feeling. What are you really feeling? What are you being really present in your body at that moment? Both people must be. That is the mandate, you know, because you are the one who is expressing through your body and the Dom is the one who is attuned to that, right? Who is watching every little like motion and flinch and reading your energy field. So you have to be moving that energy in a way where that dance can occur. And the the consciousness that I witness in these communities so far surpasses whatever the hell is going on in the bedroom for most people, including in my life for my whole life, um, which is like this mis like messy mix, right? Like of like, as Betty Martin and her work is on like giving and taking and allowing and receiving. And like, I think like, oh, my pleasure comes from pleasuring him, right? And then we're both having orgasms, so that works. And there's no sense of who is serving whose needs in a given moment. There's no sense of like the complementarity. There's no sense of like who is in what domain. There's no organization of that. And because of that, there really isn't ever consent. There's not ever conscious clarity as to what is occurring. What are the desires? What are the intentions? What are the parameters? When does it begin and end? How does it end? Is there aftercare? Is there a transition, right? And so we're not accessing God, right? We are not accessing this transcendent realm that is totally available to us through our bodies and certainly in polarity play. So for me, it's just this like delightful realm of exploration where the war gets to be over and somehow both people win even though it looks like both people could never actually want the same thing, right? Because we're so different and there's one in this energy and one in that energy, but what is it to come into that complementarity? I mean, it's, it's a template, I think, for how do we live in the world with, you know, mask wearers and people who refuse to wear a mask? Do we just go into our silos, right? That's what angry bitch feminism is, right? To the, the, the sacred masculine, right? Do we just say like, you failed me and I'm going to punish you till, you know, the end of time while they're over here hating us. Like, are we doing that or are we finding a way for these polarities to come into complementarity so that both of us have our needs served? And I have no idea what that looks like on the collective <laughs> level when it comes to things like public health and wellness and health conceptualization. But in the sexual domain, people have figured it out. And that seems like a pretty good place to start as far as really looking at what it takes to come into the proper energetic component so that what you say you want is actually something that becomes available to you. And this is an area that I think the dimension of play, the dimension of asking for what you want, being able to really be clear about that is, is powerful. And it can be like for couples that are listening or individuals that have been listening and in a relationship that maybe has gone stagnant. I mean, one of the most popular New York Times um, issues was on sexless marriage. So, and that shouldn't happen. Like I can't say shouldn't I mean, you don't want to use the word shouldn't, but like when that happens, when you find yourself in a sexless marriage, what truth are we expressing? What is it that you want? What makes you happy inside and outside the bedroom? Where do you want to push your boundaries? Where do you want to push your limits? Where can you open yourself to possibilities that you may want to explore, be able to communicate that and also listen to what he may want to, your partner may want to explore. And I think that's like, for me in working in the intimacy place, you know, reconnecting couples so that they ideally are, are nourished and fulfilled on so many levels. Cause oxytocin is my drug of choice oxytocin hundred percent, right? So orgasm gets you there, laughter, play, all of those things get you there in oxytocin with oxytocin. So does gratitude and charity. So increasing oxytocin in a relationship is the, is the cement. So when you find yourself in a, in a sexless marriage, and I know you have just a few minutes left, can, how's your time 
We're yeah. we'll wrap up now. Yeah. Okay. This is so good. I'm like, oh, I hate to cut you off. And, and I've got rapid fire questions for you. So, um, so, you know, in, in working, like working in the space to remove that stagnancy to potentially ideally hope to reignite a fire in a couple, what would you say? Like, I mean, introducing some, uh, role play, polar, polarized play, really expressing, like bringing that up. How can you, what language can you use in a relationship to do that? So I, um, was very influenced by Jaya's work and the erotic blueprints. And I think that just like understanding how it is that you give and receive love, understanding how it is that you give and receive sexual pleasure habitually, reflexively, um, is very essential self-knowledge, right? And that involves things like body mapping, right? Like, do you only think your clitoris has nerve endings or is it actually really pleasurable to like run your fingers around your kneecap, right? And what does it feel like if you use the cold, sharp thing versus the soft, fluffy thing, right? So you're really getting down to the basics of self-intimacy. And I know, you know, that when I first hired my coach who's erotic blueprints trained, um, I wanted to try to save my relationship, right? And I mean, it's funny now because it was like, uh, yeah, um, meant to go up in flames. However, um, that's what I thought, like, oh, we need to do this together and we're going to fix this together. And she was very adamant that first you, first me, I've been doing all the work already, you know, I'm trying to, no, first you, right? So it's how do I get to a place where I no longer imagine that a man can pleasure me better than I can, where I no longer imagine that he knows things that I couldn't possibly know, where he could bring me somewhere that I couldn't possibly bring myself. I'm still in this practice of relating to um, creating safety first and then dynamic opening in my self-pleasure practice. And honestly, most of the time, it doesn't look like dildos and vibrators. It looks I'm, I'm like glad you, I just want to pause for a second because you say self-pleasuring. I use that. I don't like the word masturbation at all, but self-pleasuring and it goes beyond the um, genitals. Yeah. It's just even finding safety first, creating the container where like my body feels attended to instead of, as I joke, like my inner rapist who comes to the self-pleasure session is like, all right, now we're, we're doing the G-spot thing and this is happening. And when I come, we're done. And then I'm going to go do the other thing, right? That is rapey energy, right? So like, what is it to have a relationship where I'm actually listening, where I'm actually present and where like, if my feet are cold, I take a minute to put the socks on, you know, or the yeah. light, is right? I do this, right? And I really ground into feeling the support of the bed first. What is and, it to do all of that? And there's a switch that like I was try to describe the difference between sports sex and energetic sex, yeah. right? The multi-dimensions of that. Yeah. Sports sex can be fun, but energetic sex. And what does that bring into your awareness? And, and, um, being able to expand your orgasm, being able to expand those feelings of intimacy, pleasure, sensation, and again, oxytocin. So absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you. I know I, I'm watching the time. I'm going to do my quick rapid fire questions, Kelly, which the Girlfriend Doctor show is based on four pillars and that is nourish, shine, awaken, and embrace. So for nourish, what is the food that nourishes you the most? Wow. Well, nourish versus satisfy are very different things. I learned from my water fast that I have a bona fide um, salt addiction and I love salt and it gives me such a deep pleasure in my body. Um, however, I, I think that actually what is the most like nourishing is when I've, what I've discovered is like these watery fruits, like watermelon. Oh, you know, my daughter, um, I brought some Sabra fruit down the other day and that's cactus fruit. And, uh, was, I, I guess it's the first time that I gave it to my daughter, um, who's now 14 and they were beautiful at the middle Eastern store. So I, I she, woke me up last night. It was like 10 30 in the evening. And she's like, mom, can I have that other Sabra fruit? I can't find it. And she just loved it. It's so beautiful and color and rich and yeah, phytonutrients. And I was just so glad when your body finds something that's juicy and delicious. All right. Shine, your skin is beautiful. What do you attribute your natural beauty to? Oh, thank you. Um, trauma work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, brings a smile to your face or is, uh, 
is how much my appearance has changed and how, you know, in my mid forties, I feel more beautiful than I've ever felt in my life. And including like in my twenties and how could that be? Right. What is that? Um, to me, it's, I can see literally like even when I look at um, videos I did like last year, I see there's like a, like a puff of sadness, like over my face, you know, and I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how, that's real. I had, you know, like I haven't changed anything else. Right. So, so the way that I call it like insolment, I don't know if I made up the word, but it's like, as your soul comes into your body, you animate differently, you look differently, you wear weight differently. And yeah. So, so I literally think the answer to any, any of my sort of like aesthetic, um, or cosmetic, um, you know, experiences is, is, is my trauma work is, is having a dedication to meeting all these parts of myself that I otherwise would never have met if I didn't enter, as I say, through the upset. Yeah. You know, one earlier on in our conversation, we talked about defenses and and for me that created a visual, like when we have defense systems up, we have boundaries, like old castles have moats or walls and gates and all these things. And a lot of times like those defenses may keep us safe, but they also can keep us from feeling and expressing ourselves. And I think, you know, one of the things you've done so beautifully in our conversation is express yourself. So I want to thank you for that. Oh, the final pillar is embrace. So I like to ask this question. Um, what is your favorite sexual position? I'm just adding them to my list. So I would say it's missionary good old missionary, because I have always relished this transcendent divine opportunity to create that microcosmic orbit, you know, with a partner and to really come into eyes open connection. Um, you know, I think for a lot of my earlier sexual life, I was always, I needed to close my eyes to feel and to really sort of like orient inside myself. And so much of my self pleasure practice that these days has been to how can I stay with what is and even travel outside while still feeling, you know, whatever is going on inside. And so that's just so available in that position. And I think that um, what resonates is really feeling, really feeling present, really feeling yourself, really feeling your environment, really feeling connected, really feeling heard. Um, I think those are those that really resonates. I want to thank you. Please tell our audience where to find you and where to get your books and how to connect with you on another level. Beautiful. So yeah, it's pretty much just my website and newsletter because even Telegram, my Telegram channel is being algorithmically drained and um, still shadow banned on Instagram and kicked off Facebook. So um, I, I really am treating my my website like the hub, I guess it was meant to be. And there's tons of free resources on there and hopefully a way to sort of like find your place in in the journey that I, I lay out. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I want to thank our audience for listening. I know we have touched on a lot of topics here that are going to be hot buttons for you, my audience. So please let me know your questions. You can email team at drannacabeca.com. So T-E-A-M at drannacabeca.com. Email any questions. I will address them in any follow-up or, or personally as need fit. And I definitely want to open this conversation. I want to hear from you too. Like what's resonated with you? What do you want to investigate more? Where do you feel like, okay, there's, this is the, the pearl from this conversation that I can take home. Look, take what resonates, leave what doesn't. Take the first thing. There's so much good in the conversation that happened, shedding some of our defense mechanisms, still keeping very, very safe and being authentically who we are is key to showing up as your best self. So, you know, like I love my hashtag more sexy. Like, what does that mean for you? Where do you, where are you hiding or, or not experiencing all the delight that you have so much ability to have and deserve in your life as you are worthy. So I encourage you guys, please let me know how you're doing, any feedback, any questions and share that with me. I love being your girlfriend doctor till next time.